Hello and welcome back to the channel and today's complete beginner video will be making a Minecraft clone in Godot. And while knowing how to make Minecraft in Godot will not help my terrible building skills, watching this video will teach you everything you need to know to get the same result, including how to make a character controller, how to set up a block system, and how to place and destroy blocks. All assuming that you don't have any previous experience with the engine. So let's get right into it. Getting Godot is a very simple process. Just go to GodotEngine.org and hit download latest. By the time you're watching this, this version will probably be newer, but all of this will still work up until version 5 and maybe beyond. Once you unzip the downloaded folder, you should see these two files. Click on the one that doesn't say console to open Godot. This is the list of our projects, which is empty for now, so let's change that. Click on new, and then under project path, click on browse, and navigate to where you want to put your Godot files. Here we'll create a new folder which will contain all of our projects. Once that's done, it should automatically take us to this new folder. So click on select current folder. Next we'll name our first project, we'll call this one Godot Craft, and let's take a look at some of the options here. The engine asks us to choose a render, and it's okay if that's over your head because I'll explain it. The forward plus one has the latest, juiciest 3D graphics, and is used on desktop platforms, so this is the one we'll be going for. The mobile one sacrifices some of that juice, and is optimized specifically for mobile platforms. And finally, the compatibility one uses older rendering technology, which means that not only can it run on more platforms including the browser, but it also runs faster across the board, at the cost of not looking as good as the other two of course. We're going to use the forward plus one, but you can switch between these and project settings at any point. Finally, before creating the project, make sure to click on create folder, which will create a folder with the project name for us, and when we click on create and edit, it will save all of the files there. After Godot is done loading, we get our brand new project. Let's take a look at this. This is the 3D view and we can look around by holding the right mouse button and moving the mouse. We can move around with the WASP keys while holding the right mouse button and we can adjust the movement speed with the scroll wheel again while holding the right mouse button. The 3D view is used to place objects around in the level as well as inside of other various scenes that we're creating. We'll touch on scenes in a second but for now let's take a look at the other two views that we have here. We can switch between them up top and the 2D view is mostly used for 2D games but in 3D games we will use it to place user interface elements on the screen. And finally the script view is where we will write our code once we need to. Cool, so let's go back to the 3D view and create our first scene. Here it prompts us to choose a root node for the scene and since this is a 3D game we'll go for the 3D scene option. After we click it, the engine will add what's called a root node for us. We can rename it to world or level and then save it in our file system. Press Control S and choose a name and then let's create a folder for all of our scenes. After creating the folder, click on save and once we look in the file system, we can see our newly added folder and world with the TSCN extension. Finally, scenes, nodes, both terms I've used a lot but haven't fully explained so let's do that. The most fundamental building block of a Godot game is a node. A game can consist of hundreds of nodes and there's a bunch of different types. If we right click on the root node here and choose the add child node option we can see all of the types of nodes we have available to us. There are three major categories of nodes. 2D nodes which are used in 2D games and have blue icons, control nodes which are our user interface nodes have green icons, and finally 3D nodes which are used in 3D games have red icons. So if we wanted to add a button for example, we would expand the control category, find the base button type, and choose the button node here. And that's the kind of things that nodes are. Buttons, labels, if you want a character running around, you go into the 3D nodes and find the character body 3D node. If you want a tree or a house, you add a static body 3D node because it doesn't move, and all of these nodes have their own little functionalities that can help us build a complete game. The first node that we're going to add here is called a CSG box. If we go into the visual instance, geometry instance, CSG shape, and CSG primitive, you'll see 
see the CSG box here. Definitely not an ideal way of finding notes quickly, so instead, if you know the type of node you want to add, you can type its name in the search bar. If we double click on it, Godot will add the CSG box to the scene tree, and it will appear in the view here. It's just a simple box, we can see it in game, characters can walk in it, we can change its size and proportions, and we're going to use these to set up a simple level where we can test out our player's movement. To loop back around to scenes, our little collection of nodes here is the level scene that we're building. We will put our player character and our environment into this level, click this little button here, and our game is running. So that's the first use of scenes. They can be complete games or levels that we tell the engine to run. The second use we will cover in a bit, but for now, let's lay out this level. After making sure that our CSG box is selected in the scene tree, let's turn this one into the floor of our level by making it super wide and long. You can see that there are three different properties in charge of the size of the box, and each just corresponds to its length on the specific axis. For example, the X size property is red, and in the 3D view, we can find the X axis by looking for the red line. So let's make this one 100 units wide, and then look for the blue axis, which is the length, or Z here, to make it 100 units long as well. And that should give our main character something to walk on. Let's fly out in our 3D view by holding the right mouse button and using the WASD keys like before. Right now, the floor is just plain white, which is not okay, which takes us to the next topic, materials. So a drawn 3D object consists of two parts. The geometry, also known as the mesh, which we already have in the form of this box, as well as the material, which is responsible for defining how the surface of the object looks and interacts with the light. To create a material for the box, we need to click on this empty text here and select New Standard Material 3D. To edit it, we need to click on the circle that appeared in the material property, and there's like a billion options here. Most of them have to do with how light affects this material, but for now, we're only concerned with the color go into the albedo section, and if we had a texture that we wanted to use for this box, we could put it here as well, but for this one we'll just go with a solid color. We'll go for a nice dark green here, and you may notice that it doesn't quite look like we'd expect in the 3D view, and that's because the object is selected at the moment. When we deselect it by clicking on empty space, we can see the final result. Cool, so let's add a couple more CSG boxes as obstacles by right-clicking on the floor node and choosing the Add Child node option. Choose CSG box here again, and then let's set the size of this one to what the size of our blocks will be later. I know that the models that we'll be using are 2 by 2 by 2 by default, and it's honestly a little easier to just adapt the player to that size. After that, we can move the block around by dragging these arrow gimbals, and we can make sure that it snaps while moving by holding control. When we're done placing the first one, we can duplicate it by hitting control D on the keyboard, which adds an exact copy of the block. Now, usually, we would want to duplicate it when it already has a material so that carries forward, but just for this example I will show how we can reuse materials on different objects. We'll go to create a material like before, go into the albedo settings and set the color to let's say a brown one for dirt, and then we can click on the drop down next to the material circle or whatever that is, and select the save option. Just to keep things neat, we are going to create a materials folder for this, and then let's rename our new material to dirt and keep the T res extension, which stands for resource file. In the file system, we'll get the material file, so let's select the block without a material, and to set its material, we just need to drag the file into the material dialog. Like I said before, if we duplicate a block by pressing Ctrl D when it already has a material, the material will carry over, so let's place a couple more blocks to properly test out the player's movement. We can also select multiple blocks before duplicating them to copy the whole group. So finally, adding a couple of finishing touches. We don't really need too much detail here to start because this is just a quick prototype level. After we're done editing, this little asterisk next to our world scene tab means that it's unsaved, so press Ctrl S to save it. So let's talk a little bit about the scene structure here. Why are all of these CSG boxes indented from our 4 CSG box? 
Well, it means that they are children of the four box. If you're familiar with coding terminology and object-oriented programming, it doesn't mean the same thing here. When a node is a child of another node, it just means that it's attached to it. So when we try to move or rotate the four, all of the boxes that are its children will move with it. This is especially useful for clumping together nodes that are part of the same entity. For example, if we were to make a car and had a node for the car body and four nodes for each of the wheels, we wouldn't really want the wheels to be left behind when we try to move the body. So we would make all of them children of the same car node. In this case, it's also useful for keeping things tidy because we can just hide all of the blocks from the scene tree by clicking on this drop down next to the parent. And before I forget, we need to make sure to turn on collisions for these boxes so that our player doesn't fall through the floor once we put him in. Select the 4 CSG box and tick this Use Collision option, which will turn on collisions for the 4 and any CSG boxes that are children of the 4. Okay, so the level is done for now, but what do we need to run this and actually see it in game? Godot, as well as any other game engine, uses a camera node for that. So we're going to right click on the world node and add a child to it. If we type camera into the search bar, we can find it more easily. Let's select the camera 3D node and double click it. This will create the node for us and select it, so let's bring it up and back here using the movement arrows. The camera 3D node is basically just the point from which we view the game world. If we click on the preview button here with the camera selected, we can see what the camera sees. Well, not quite. What we will actually see is this unlit scene because we're missing a directional light and a world environment node which are responsible for creating the lighting. When we're looking at the scene in the editor, those are displayed for us by default but they are not carried forward into the game itself. To make sure that they are, we just need to have those two nodes and the scene tree. We could go the old route and right click on the world node and add them both as children or just for these two nodes, let's turn them back on in the editor and we can click on these three dots here and there's an option to add them both to the scene. Before we do that, we can change some quick settings like the color and the strength of the sunlight. We can change the direction where it's coming from and all of these settings and way more are available to us after we add these to the scene. So let's do that. Let's add the sun and then click on the three dots again and add the environment to the scene as well. So let's take a look at the options for the directional light by selecting it in the scene tree and looking at the inspector on the right. A lot of it, like the light settings, are pretty self-explanatory and the most interesting part of it, in my opinion, are the shadow settings. The default shadow settings are pretty good and balanced, but if you have a potato and a lot of objects in the scene, it might be smart to mess around with changing the shadow mode from PSSM 4 split to orthogonal shadows. They don't look quite as good, but are significantly faster to render. So that's the directional light. The world environment node, in my opinion, is way more interesting. Let's select it in the scene tree and in the inspector. A lot of the options are actually hidden behind this environment resource that we need to click to expand. The world environment node is responsible for a lot of the lighting settings that can seriously change your game's atmosphere. We can change the sky background from a procedural sky that we have right now to a panorama sky if we have a texture for that. We can turn on screen space ambient occlusion to make the lighting on object corners more realistic and and a lot of these you will have no idea what they mean and that's okay. You can hover over the setting and the explanations and the tooltips usually do a really good job at explaining it. You can turn on SDFGI which is Godot's global elimination system for realistic lighting or you can turn on volumetric fog to make it spooky. In short, I highly recommend that you look through these settings at some point because they are really cool and can make your game better at the cost of turning one of them on. Okay, so we're ready to start the game. Let's save the project by pressing Ctrl S and click on the play icon in the top right corner. This will tell us that the project has no main scene defined, so we're going to click on select current to tell the engine that the scene that we're editing right now is the one that's supposed to run. Once the game runs, it will open in this small window and all we can do right now is see the scene from the viewpoint of the camera that we created. It would be nice if the game was full screen and if we could actually move around 
around. The full screen part is easy, we just need to go into the project settings over here and click on window under display and change the mode from windowed to exclusive full screen. And then the viewport width and height are the resolution that we will run the game in. So I'm going to set this to 2560 by 1440 because that's my display resolution. As for moving around, we're going to need to create a player character. Like I said before, it's going to be relatively complex and will consist of multiple nodes, the camera being one of them. We can get rid of this one for now by hitting the delete key, and to make the player we're actually going to create a new scene by clicking on this plus sign next to the world tab. We're going to be greeted with a familiar screen prompting us to choose a root node. And we're going to go for node 3D like before. We'll rename this one to player, and after that we're actually going to change the type of the root node by right-clicking on it and selecting change type. Because right now it's just a node 3D and all that does is it sits in some point in space and can have children nodes. That's it. Our player character needs to be part of the physics simulation and it needs to be able to collide with other physical objects like the boxes that we created before. That's why we'll make the root node of the player a character body 3D, which is a node specialized for player characters, NPCs, enemies, anything that needs to move and have a physical body. Godot is giving us a warning here though, so let's hover over it and read. This node has no shape, so it can collide or interact with other objects. Consider adding a collision shape 3D. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to right-click on the player and add a collision shape 3D node to define what the physical body of the player looks like. When we do that, however, we get another warning. A shape must be provided for collision shape 3D to function. Please create a shape resource for it. This is the last warning for now, I promise. And in the inspector here, we can click on the empty shape to choose the kind of shape that we want. We have a bunch of options here, but for characters, we usually want either a cylinder shape or a capsule shape. Capsule characters can slide off ledges and cylinders kind of just fall straight down. Up to you, I'm going for a capsule. This will give us this kind of wire mesh to denote that you cannot see this in game, but that's the part of the character that collides with things. If we click on this resource, we can set the radius and the height of the collision shape. And if you remember, when we created the blocks, they were two units on one side, so we'll make our character twice as tall and set its height to four units and radius to one unit. So what now? Why can't we see our character yet? Well, the visual part of a 3D game object is actually another node called a mesh. So we'll add another child node to the player, type mesh in the search bar, and add a mesh instance 3D node. Just like with the collision shape, we're going to define a shape for it, choose capsule mesh, and then change its size to match the collision shape. And you might be sitting there thinking that we didn't have to do all of this for the CSG boxes. There are just one node that we can both see and collide with. And you would be right. CSG boxes combine all of these nodes into one so that it's easier to prototype games. The reason why it's not combined here is because the visual and the physical geometry in games is usually separated. The reason for that is because we can draw and show very complex shapes with hundreds of thousands of vertices to get really cool looking games, but calculating collisions between those shapes involves math that is exponentially more intensive, so instead the actual physical bodies of those objects in games are simple shapes like capsules, boxes, etc. So the one thing that we're still missing is a camera. Let's add that real quick, drag it up to here, kind of eye level, and don't worry, it won't be able to see our mesh because it's transparent from the inside. So that's pretty much it for the nodes that we'll need to get the player movement working, but the player scene is still unsaved, so let's press Ctrl S to do that. We'll go into our scenes folder, and the file name takes the name of the root node by default, so we're good there. Finally, to place the player into the level, let's go back to our world scene, and we can literally just drag the player file that we got into the scene view. Let's drag it up so it's on the floor, and this is basically the second use of scenes. Since this is just a collection of nodes, we can place it into another scene as a way to reuse it in multiple levels, 
or even create multiple copies of it. We can even create scenes at runtime, so if we wanted to spawn an enemy for example, we would have an enemy scene and with a few lines of code we could add it to the level whenever we need to. So if we were to run the game right now, it wouldn't be very different from what we saw before because our player can't really move just yet. To get it moving, we would have to add a script to the player to specify what is supposed to be happening to the nodes in the player scene every frame. So let's go back to the player scene and right click on the root node. Here we'll select attach script and this will open a window for us where we can select the name and the location for the script. So let's click on this folder icon to create a new folder for all of our scripts. Navigate back to the root create a new folder and type the folder name. Then click on open to specify this folder as the file location. Here, before we click create, there's actually a built-in code template that can help us get started with the movement. So select the character body 3D basic movement template, which gives us a good starting point for creating a player script and click create. For a lot of you, this is going to be the scariest point in the video. This is a lot of text. Don't worry though, I got you. Let's take a look at some of the general code structure of GDS Script first, and then we'll go through the code line by line. If you're familiar with Python at all, you're going to feel right at home. But for those of you who are not, let me explain what all of this indentation means. Here we have the definition for the physics process function and a semicolon after it. Everything that comes after the semicolon and is indented to the right is part of this function and will run whenever this function is called. Same goes for our if statements. We have an if statement with a condition and then a semicolon. Everything that is indented after will run only if the condition is met. So this code is part of this if statement, the other code is part of the other if statement, etc. Now, what do the colors mean? The blue text are the functions. You can also tell those apart by the parentheses after them. The white ones are variables or constants that we defined in the script, like gravity or speed. And then the light blue ones are properties, which are kind of like variables that the node that the script is attached to has by default. In this case, a character body 3D has velocity by default. Okay. So let's go through this line by line so we can actually understand it. The first line, extends character body 3D, tells the script that the node that it is attached to is a character body 3D, so that all of the properties and methods that a character body 3D is supposed to have will be available to us here. And if we hold control and click on character body 3D here, it will take us to the documentation and we can see all of these properties and methods. For example, the velocity property is here, which will be changing based on our inputs. After this come the methods. These are basically pre-written code that helps the character body do all the different things that it's supposed to do. For example, we'll be using the move and slide function every frame to move the character around based on its velocity. And if we want to know more about any of these, we can just click on them and it will take us to the part of the document that describes their function. If you're ever confused about what something does in Godot, your first response should probably be looking at the documentation. So let's go back to the player script by clicking on it in this table. After the extends character body 3D line, we have our constant and variable definitions. Constants and variables are pretty similar, they both store some form of information, but the difference is that constants cannot be changed when the game starts. The speed constant is going to be the maximum speed of the character when it's walking. The jump velocity is going to be the vertical velocity that we apply to the character when we press space or the jump button. And gravity is the acceleration that will apply to the character when it's not on the floor. In this case, it's taken from the project settings default, which is 9.8 to match Earth's gravity. And let's take a look at how we get it from the project settings. We have the project settings object, which is available to all scripts. If you're a bit more familiar with coding, this is a singleton. 
And on that, we call a function called getSetting. We can tell it's a function, aka method, because of the parentheses. And to that function, we pass the path to the setting that we want as the parameter. What we get out of it is the default gravity setting, which is 9.8, which we then assign to the gravity variable in our player. After that, we have a function definition for physics process. And physics process is a special function which is automatically triggered on every every physics object in the game dozens of times per second to calculate movement. How we calculate that movement is up to us, hence the billion lines of code that come after. This function gets a delta parameter that tells us how much time in seconds has passed since the last time this function was called. This parameter is very useful to us because to calculate movement of objects when we have the velocity and starting position, we also need to know how much time has passed. So we use this function to move the character pretty much every frame. The first thing that needs to happen every frame is applying the gravity acceleration. First, we check if the character is on the floor, which is a function inside of character body 3D. And since there is no object before this function call, like when we we're getting the gravity setting, it means that we're calling it on the player, since that's what the script is attached to. This function returns either true or false, which is a boolean, and if it's not true, we run this bit of code to apply gravity. From velocity y, which is the vertical portion of velocity, we subtract gravity times delta. And delta again is how long has passed since the last time we did this exact thing. This way we figure out how much to accelerate downward on this frame. After applying gravity, we get into our first bit of input where we handle jumping. First, we check if the space key is pressed. We use the input object available to all scripts, and we call the isActionJustPressed function, which, just like the isOnFloor function, returns true or false. And we pass it the UI accept action, which is bound to space by default. And all of these actions we can see if we go into the project settings here. Click on input map and show built-in actions. UI accept has space and has enter bound to it. So now we know that the player just pressed space, but we don't want to be able to jump while in the air. So we're also going to check that we're on the floor with this familiar function. If both of these conditions are met, we need to jump. We do that by setting the y velocity to our jump velocity. Since that number is positive, that sends us flying up. And then gravity does its thing and slowly lowers our y velocity into the negatives until we're back on the floor. So all of this takes care of the movement on the Y axis. What about movement on the Z, which is forward and back, and movement on the X, which is left and right? The first thing that we do here is figure out which direction we should be moving relative to the player based on the arrow keys that we pressed. Are we moving forward or are we moving back? Maybe we're moving diagonally? Traditionally, that takes like four if statements to figure out, but Godot has a built-in function that can combine four directional inputs into a single movement vector. So this input direction variable that we're creating here gets the movement vector from the input object based on the arrow key presses. This is a vector two that we get from this. It only has an X and a Y component. The order that we pass the arrow key actions to it matters because the way that it's set up now, the X component of the 2D input vector that we get matches the left and right inputs. And then the Y component matches the up and down inputs. So for example, if we're just going forward and have the up arrow pressed, the 2D vector that we get from this function would be 0, negative 1 because negative Z is forward in Godot. Don't ask me why, I don't know the answer to that question. Now, we want to convert this into a 3D direction that's not relative to the player, but relative to the world. So we'll define a new variable for this and call it direction. The first step would be to change this 2D vector into a 3D vector. So we'll make a new 3D vector and its X is going to be the X from the input direction. The Y will be zero because we're moving on the horizontal plane. And then the Z will be the Y from the input direction. We then want to take this new vector and multiply it by the transform basis. The transform basis is a matrix of three vectors that define the rotation and the scaling of our character. 
You don't need to fully understand how that works just yet, but you do need to understand that multiplying our input direction vector by it will apply the rotation of our character to the vector. This process may result in the vector not being length 1 anymore, but we still want it to be, so that's why we call the normalized function that vectors have to make sure that it's a unit vector. So now that we have a movement direction vector, we want to check if it's non-zero, and it could be a zero vector if the player didn't press any input keys. So if direction. This is kind of a trick, but because what we want in an if statement is a boolean, true or false, Godot can automatically convert a vector into a boolean. If that vector has any non-zero components whatsoever, it's automatically true. So this could be written as if direction is not a zero vector. This means that the player pressed an input, so we want to take our x velocity and set it to be the x direction where we want to go, multiplied by the speed constant. And of course, the same goes for the z velocity. Now, if the player didn't press any inputs, we want to bring the character to a stop. The way that it's done here in this template is a little weird, because functionally, this code block is equivalent to setting the x velocity to zero. This is because the move toward function takes the z velocity, the target of zero, and then subtracts the speed constant once from our current z velocity. And if that overshoots the target of zero, it will set it to zero. Long story short, we're just going to set both of these to zero so that this code is more readable. So all of this together modifies the velocity parameter of the player every frame based on our inputs and based on the gravity. But what about actually moving the player? Well, as it turns out, this is actually the easy part. We just call the move and slide function that the character body 3D has built in, and it handles the actual movement and collisions for us. So let's take a look at what the function does by holding control and clicking it. This takes us to the part of the character body documentation that explains it. So the move and slide function moves the body based on its velocity. If the body collides with another, it will slide along the other body rather than stop immediately. So is the sliding what we want? Well, yeah, because if we run into a wall at a 45 degree angle, we wouldn't want to completely stop, but want some portion of our actual velocity to be transferred into motion, which this function does for us. And the second important part of this function is that it modifies velocity if a slide collision occurred. So if we're falling, for example, and we hit the ground, this will automatically set the vertical velocity to zero for us. Very useful. So let's go back to the player script and pat ourselves on the back because we just got through the most difficult part of the video. Before we start the game and see all of this working, let's create some custom actions for movement because with the default actions, we don't have the WASD keys bound. Let's go back to the project settings turn off show built-in actions, and we can create new actions by typing a name here. So we need an action for up, click add, we need an action for down, left, right, and jump. We can then add keybinds to these actions by clicking on the plus sign next to them and pressing the key that we want to use. So let's quickly go through all of these actions to bind them to their keys. I'll come back to add the arrow keys later just so that the video doesn't drag on. After that press close and we just need to change the actions that we're passing to our input functions to these new actions that we created. With these directional ones make sure that you're not changing the order of the directions and finally change the UI except one to jump here. We can now get rid of this comment telling us to replace the default actions with a clear conscience and then let's start up the game. In game we can move around with the WASD keys and we can jump. Unfortunately we're not really clearing this jump up to a block so we'll have to play around with the jump velocity a little bit. As you might have noticed, there was no code for looking around in the script, so we can't do that just yet. And also, we can see the mouse cursor. That needs to be gone. So let's work on those. To close down the game, press Alt-Tab and click on this stop icon in the top right. To get rid of the mouse cursor in game, we're going to use a function called underscore ready. Let's define it here by typing func underscore ready, 
open and close parentheses because this function doesn't have any parameters, and then semicolon. When we press enter, Godot will go to the new line, but also indent the next line with a tab to denote that this is part of this function. Let's type pass here for now as a placeholder that doesn't do anything, so we don't get any errors for having a function with nothing in it. So the ready function is one of Godot's special functions like physics process, and is triggered by the engine automatically. But instead of getting triggered dozens of times per second every physics tick, this one is only triggered when the object is loaded into the scene, so it is used as a way to do some setup before the game actually starts running. And this function will reference the input object that we're already familiar with and call the set mouse mode function on it. When we open parentheses, Godot will give us a couple of options here, and we're looking for mouse mode captured. This mode will hide the mouse and keep it in the center of the screen, which is a good option for first person games in general. So that takes care of the mouse. Now to actually look around with the character, we're going to use another special function called unhandled input. Unhandled input is triggered every time the player does anything, like pressing a button or moving the mouse. It gets this event parameter from the engine, which has all of the information that we need to know about what the player did. For example, we only want to look around when the player moved the mouse, so we're going to check if the input event that we got from the engine is of type input event mouse motion. Place a semicolon, and then if that's the case, we want to start with player Y rotation and set it to be the current Y rotation minus the position of the mouse on the X axis relative to where it was the last time this function was called. So why are we subtracting relative position here instead of adding it? And more importantly, why are we changing the Y rotation if we're moving the mouse on the X axis? To illustrate that, let's quickly go back to the 3D view where we can see our character. If we select the root node and open the transform settings, we can see our rotation properties. Keep an eye on these while we rotate the character around in the 3D view. What we're doing when we're rotating on the Y is actually rotating around the Y axis. So we're looking left and right. That's why when we move the mouse horizontally, we want to rotate the character on the Y axis. And if we want to look right and move the mouse that way, the relative mouse position is going to be positive. But if we look at the rotation value when we turn the character right to follow the mouse, that's negative. So that's why we're subtracting the relative mouse position. So let's go back to the script view. The last thing to consider here is that when we're changing the rotation property, we're setting the rotation in radians, which means that if we add six to the rotation, we pretty much spun the whole way around, but the event relative is measured in something tiny like pixels. So if we leave it at this, our sensitivity is going to be insane. To counteract it, we're going to add a sensitivity variable here and set it to be something small like 0.002, and then multiply the event relative number by this sensitivity. So this will let our character look left and right. And as an additional benefit, when we're moving around, this rotation will be taken into account when we're figuring out the direction of our movement. This is because the transform basis is a combination of all axis rotations, and by multiplying the input vector by it, we get our movement direction. So our Y rotation is included in the transform basis. And this next bit is where we run into a problem. We could technically copy paste this code and switch the Y's and X's around, and that would let us look up and down. But since we know that our rotation affects our movement direction, that also means that we would start walking into the sky if we were to change our character's X rotation to look up. So instead of changing our character's rotation when looking up, we will instead change the camera's rotation. So let's create a variable for the camera so we can easily access it in the script. We can do that for all the different nodes in the scene by holding control and dragging them into the code. So now we can access the camera in the script by typing the name of the variable that Godot created for us. And here before rotation x, type camera 3d dot to access the rotation of the camera instead. We'll copy this over to this bit as well and we're pretty much set. Before we start the game, let's mess around with the numbers here and maybe increase our speed to 8, the jump velocity to 8 as well just so 
that we can jump onto blocks. And as for the gravity, we could change it in the project settings, but we'll just set it to 16 here to keep it short. All of this should make the player movement a bit more responsive once we start the game. In game, we can finally look around and we can now jump up to this block. If I'm being picky, I would say that the gravity still feels a little floaty, but the biggest issue at the moment is that if we keep bringing the mouse up, we can spin our camera around in a 360 degree angle, which is super unrealistic. To solve that, we're going to have to go back to our code and in the unhandled input function where we set the camera rotation X, we're going to make sure that we don't go over or under certain values. We essentially want to limit how far the rotation of the camera can go up or down. For that, after we adjust the rotation, we're going to set it to the result of the quam function. And the quam function takes three inputs, the current value, the minimum, and the maximum. The current value is just going to be the current rotation, then we want our minimum to be something like negative 70 degrees, but since rotation is measured in radians, we will use the degrees to radians function and pass it negative 70 degrees. And then the maximum will be 80 degrees, so degrees to radians 80. So what this will do is if the rotation is between those two values, it will keep it as is, but if it's lower than negative 70, it will set it to negative 70. And the same goes for the maximum. Now as for the jump velocity and gravity, let's set those to 12 and 24 respectively. Once we start the game, we can't do the 360 spin anymore, which is good, and jumping feels way better. There's a bunch more things that we could add to the character controller, like head bob inertia and sprinting, all of which I go over in my more in-depth tutorial on the channel. But this tutorial is already ridiculously long and we have a system for block placement that we need to add. To do that, we're going to close down the game and go back to the world scene where we'll add a node called grid map. We're going to add it as a child of the world node and to find it quickly, type grid map in the search bar. And what a grid map allows us to do is place predetermined objects like blocks on a grid. And since Minecraft is just blocks on a grid, that's exactly what we want. Now we can look in the inspector to see that a grid map needs a mesh library. And that's going to be a collection of all the types of blocks that we can add to the level. The way that we go about creating a mesh library in Godot is by exporting a scene with a bunch of mesh nodes into a mesh library resource. You'll see how it works in a second, but let's start by creating a 3D scene and calling it blocks. Press Ctrl S and save it to the scenes folder just so that we can edit it later. And I'm going to give you two ways of creating blocks for the game, depending on if you want to download models online or not. The first way is just adding a plain mesh here, so let's search that up and select it. Choose the box mesh type for this one, and just like before, change its size to 2 by 2 by Two. Let's make a grass block out of this one, so rename it to grass, and then we can add a material to it. Then to change the block color, let's open the material settings and go into the albedo section. We'll change the color to a nice green, and note that what we have here is just a mesh the visual aspect of a 3D object. And we also need to add a collision shape here. So add a child to the grass node and type static body, which is a node that is used for a physical body of an object that doesn't move. Just like our character body before, it needs a collision shape. So add a child node to the static body and look for collision shape 3D. We'll set this one to be a box shape to match the mesh, and again, 2x2x2 two by two by two in size. And that's our grass block. Note that we cannot use CSG boxes here to speed up the process, because the mesh library can only hold meshes and their collision shapes once it's exported. If you want to add more blocks here, select the top level grass mesh node, and press Ctrl D to duplicate the whole thing. Let's say that we want to make a dirt block here. Let's rename it and drag it out using the arrow gimbals. Theoretically, we would want to change the color of the material of the dirt block, and one thing to watch out for is that this mesh shape resource and this material here are both shared between all duplicates. So if we were to change the color of this new dirt block, we would be editing the color of the grass block as well. The proper way to avoid this is by selecting the dirt mesh here, clicking on the drop down next to the shape, and selecting make unique recursive. This will prompt us to choose the resources that we want to make unique, and we want to choose both shape and material. 
So now if we change the color of this dirt block, only it will change. So if you want to create blocks this way, that's fine, but we're going to get some textured models that look a bit more like Minecraft blocks in here. Let's get rid of these two and head on over to a website that I will link in the description to download some blocks that are part of this cube world kit made by Quaternius. Hit download here, and if you have a minute, check out his Patreon because he has a bunch of cool 3D models there, then hit continue to the download. This will link us to a Google Drive with a lot of folders, we're just looking for the pixel block one, which gives us a couple of options for the file format, we'll choose GOTF because we can just drag and drop those into a Godot project. Hit download all here, which will download a zip file of this folder. Once that's extracted, we get a folder full of GOTF files that we can drop into our Godot project, so let's create a folder for them called models. Make sure that this folder is selected and then drag all of the models into this folder. That imports a model file as well as a separate texture file for each of them. We need to add the GOTF files to the scene, so filter them by GOTF. If we look through the files, this here might happen to you, with one of the files having a red cross next to it, which means that it didn't import properly, so right click on it and select re-import. Then select all of these files and drag them into the scene on top of our blocks node. This will pop all of them in the same little space, that's why we only see one of the blocks at the moment. We can select all of them and make them invisible, and then just turn the visibility back on for them individually. I'm not going to keep all of them just for simplicity's sake, so go through the list and keep the ones that you want because later adding collision shapes to each is a bit of busy work. In the end, I'm left with these seven blocks, and to have direct access to the mesh node inside of these GOTF scenes, we need to right-click on them and select Make Local. This will expose the scene as just a container node 3D with a mesh inside of it. And we don't really need the node 3D, so we just drag the mesh out and get rid of the container. Repeat this process for each one of these, and then we can add a static body and a collision shape for the first one. The only way that this is different from what we did before is that our mesh is a textured model that we imported. For the collision shape, again, we're going to choose a box shape 2x2x2 two by two by two in size, and then we can just duplicate the whole static body by hitting Ctrl D a couple times and drag it into the rest of our blocks. By the end, you should have a static body and a collision shape on each of them. Now, the fact that they're all clumped up together doesn't really matter for the mesh library, but if you have a mild case of OCD like me, you can reposition them by changing their transforms in the inspector so that they are spread out like this. With that, the scene is ready to be exported as a mesh library, so go into the scene menu, hover export as, and select mesh library. Here we'll create a new folder for it called resources, type blocks as the name for the file, and hit save. Back in the world scene, we can use the mesh library in our grid map by dragging it into the corresponding slot. So find the library file in the file system and place it there. This will add all of the blocks that we had in the previous scene into the list here, so we can start building out a level for ourselves. Let's get rid of the CSG boxes we had before and start adding the blocks. We can paint with left quick, erase with right quick, and we can select the height at which we're adding the blocks by pressing Q and E, or holding control and scrolling the wheel. Now, if we click on this menu, we can see all of the shortcuts that may be useful to us while working with grid maps. For example, we can rotate the blocks on different axes by holding A, S, and D keys, and we can also do operations on selections here. So if we wanted to fill an area, we would select it by holding Shift, and then press Control F to fill. Now, since the WASD keys are shortcuts for grid map operations, we can't use them to move around right now. But we can enter free look mode by pressing Shift F, move to where we need to be using the WASD keys, and then press Shift F again to exit free look mode. Cool. So using what we've learned here, we can create a little island with four levels. The bottom two will just be dirt that we will later hide behind water, use the fill shortcut to quickly create these, and then sculpt them by erasing some areas while holding right quick. The top two will be grass, this will be the visible part, and obviously go nuts here. I'm sure you can all make some crazy stuff, but I'm just making an area where we can build once we add block placement in game. 
add some trees, and then make sure that the player is not stuck inside a block when he spawns. The last thing we're gonna do here for now is add water. Now to make water, we will add a mesh instance to the scene, and in the mesh type, we will choose a plain mesh. A plane is basically like a sheet of paper in the sense that it only has two dimensions, and for the size, we will go for 5,000 by 5,000. We will add a new material to this, and in the transparency setting, we will set the transparency mode to alpha. This will enable transparency for this mesh and when we go to the albedo section and change the color to blue, we can now add it the alpha parameter as well. Set it to something like 190 so that we can kind of see through it and then let's bring the mesh up just a tiny bit so it's in the middle of the first grass block. Cool, so the island is done for now, so let's save it and start up the game. Right away, it's starting to look a lot more like what we want. We got our blocks, we got our trees, we got our water, but one thing that's not looking right is the glossiness that we got on the blocks for some reason. From before, we know that it's the object material that is responsible for how the surface interacts with the light, so we need to change it. We could change the materials and the block scene and go through the export process again, but there's a quicker way to do this. If we double click on the mesh library file, we can get access to the materials here directly. It lists our seven blocks here, and if we expand them and click on the mesh resource, in the surface zero subsection, we have access to the block material. The fact that it's glossy tells me that its roughness value is too low, so we'll go in here and change it to one. We want to repeat this process for each of the items, so do that real quick, and once we start up the game again, our blocks should look a little better. So now that we have a proper block system in game, we can work on placing and destroying them. For that, we're going to need something that can tell us which block the player is currently looking at. Godot has a node for this called Raycast, which is basically like a line that's pointing in a certain direction that can tell when it intersects other collision shapes. We're going to go ahead and add it as a child of the camera inside of the player scene because we want it to follow the rotation of the player's screen. Make sure that the Raycast is under the camera like this, and if we fly over to this side and turn off the visibility on the mesh, we can see which way the camera is facing. So select the Raycast, and we want it to point in this direction as well because right now it's just pointing down on the y-axis, and as you might remember, Remember, negative Z is forward in Godot, so we will set this to negative 8Z, which will be the distance that we can reach. Then set the Y target position to zero. So now if we select the camera and then rotate it, the raycast will follow it. So what do we want to happen to say destroy a block? Well, when the player presses left click, we want to check if this raycast is touching a block, then we can take the point where it intersects with the block and convert it to the grid map coordinate system to then tell the grid map to get rid of the block in that location. So what's the grid map coordinate system and why do we need to worry about a conversion? Well, in a grid map, we measure distances and blocks, and since our blocks are 2x2x2 two by two by two in size, that's a pretty simple conversion. For example, if this block is 0, 0, 0 in both world and grid map coordinates, then this block is 2, 0, 4 in world coordinates and 1, 0, 2 in grid map coordinates because it's two units or one block to the left and four units or two blocks down. What's super convenient is that the grid map node has a function which can take any location in the world, even with decimal places, and tell us which block that location corresponds to. So we just need a world location first. That's what the raycast is for, and it can tell us the exact point where it intersected the grid map. The problem is that when it comes to using this point to convert it to grid map coordinates, it can be inaccurate. Since it's right on the edge of the block, it comes down to a coin flip whether Godot decides that it's part of this block location or this other block location right next to it. What we can do here in addition to getting the collision point between the raycast and the block is also get the collision normal from the raycast, which is a vector pointing directly away from the surface that we are touching. We can then add this collision normal to the collision point if we're right clicking to place a block or subtract it from the collision point if we're left clicking to destroy a block. Cool, so let's code this. Don't forget to turn the visibility back on for the player mesh, and let's add input actions for our mouse clicks. Go back to the project settings input map, 
add left quick action, add right quick action and click on this plus sign to bind them to left mouse button and right mouse button respectively. Then we'll go over to the player script and the first thing we want to do is add a variable for the raycast that we created so control drag it from the scene tree into the code. And the physics process function will add a section to handle mouse clicks and we'll first check if the player just pressed left click. We'll do it like before by typing if input as action just pressed and pass it our left click action. Before we try to destroy a block, we need to make sure that the raycast is actually touching one. So type if raycast dot is colliding, which is a function that returns a boolean, yes or no, depending on whether we're touching another collision shape. But that doesn't tell us if we're touching the grid map or an enemy or something else. So we need to check if what we're touching is a grid map, and there's a couple ways of doing that. What we'll do here is first get the object that we touched with the raycast by typing raycast.getCollider and then another dot and has method, which is a way of asking, does this object have this function called destroy block in this case? And only the grid map is going to have it. So if all of this is true, we can finally take the grid map by saying raycast get collider and call destroy block on it. To destroy a block, we will pass the collision point, which we get from the raycast by calling get collision point. And then if you remember, we need to subtract the collision normal from this by calling raycast get collision normal, which gives us a world coordinate that is for sure inside of the block that we're currently looking at. If you're wondering, these tabs over here don't do anything. This is only split into two lines just so that it fits inside the screen. So let's head on over to the world scene and to add that destroy block function to the grid map, we're going to right click on it and attach a script. We'll keep the name of the script as gridmap.gd, but make sure that it's saved in the scripts folder and click create. This will give us a new block blank script with just the ready and the process functions by default. We don't really need those, so get rid of them and instead define the function destroy block. This function will take the world coordinate that we pass to it inside of the player script and convert it to a map coordinate that we will save in a variable. We'll set it to be equal to the result of the local to map function inside of the grid map and pass it the world coordinate that we got from the player. This local to map function is just a default grid map function that is used exactly for this purpose. So now that we have the map coordinate, we can use another grid map function called set cell item to get rid of the block in that location. We pass it the grid map coordinate and then negative one to denote the index of an empty cell. So what does the cell index mean? If we go into the 3D view here, with our grid map selected, we have this list of blocks. This block has index zero, this block has index one, and it goes all the way up to index six with the wood planks. And then negative one stands for no block. So if instead of destroying the block in that location, we wanted to replace it with wood planks, we would pass six as the block index. And that's exactly what we'll do for when we're adding a block, but for now, let's change it back and test it out. So now we can point and click to destroy blocks in game, which is kind of exciting for us because that's half the functionality done. The next thing we're going to do is adding blocks and it's not going to be half as difficult now that we've figured out the other part. So we're going to close down the game and create a place block function for the grid map. For that we'll just copy paste the destroy block function and make a couple changes. First rename it to place block and for the parameters we're also going to take a block index because we want the player to tell us what block they're trying to place. So we'll take that block index and pass it to set cell item instead of negative one. So now let's go back to the player script and add some code to handle right quicks. We'll copy paste the left quick code and the changes that we need to make are the action that we're checking for needs to be right quick change the function that we're calling to place block. And if you remember when we talked about getting the world coordinate for placing blocks, we actually need to add the collision normal. So we'll do that here. Finally, as the second argument to place block, we'll pass six for wood planks. And just so that this looks right, let's check for the place block method instead, even though it would work as is, which it does. Starting the game, we have a really good base for a Minecraft clone, 
And in the next video, we'll make a user interface with the ability to switch between blocks and whatever else you guys think should be added. You can get all of the source code for this from my Patreon. And as some extra content, I'll be working on a save game system for when you're done building out the map. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.